you know how last time I was talking about reviewers pouncing on strange or unusual games just to have something different to talk about? Seems like I'm on a bit of a roll here, because today's game is entirely handmade. Cardboard, clay, and even broccoli are all mentioned on the Steam page and the email that my free Steam key came from. I'm running out of creative ways to say the developer sent me a free code, so I'll just say I got this for free from the developers and move on. Doesn't mention Adobe Flash, strangely enough, considering that's what the game runs on, but I suppose that doesn't fit the handmade category. That might give away how long these guys have been working on this, because Flash was a lot more relevant in 2009, and that 8 year development time may have been because, like Fran Bo, there's only two people behind the making of this. Neither team took the easy route either. Frambo was highly imaginative and surprisingly lengthy compared to modern titles, whereas the makers of the Dream Machine used stop motion, one of the most time consuming methods there is, to create the graphics. Thankfully they don't rely on that gimmick, there's more to be found in this package, so we'd better do a story and let you know what this is all about. A man wakes up on a desert island. He catches and cooks a fish, which contains a treasure map, which leads him to an alarm clock. Then he wakes up. Shorter story section ever, right? Oh honey, we've barely started. This is Victor, he and his partner Alicia have just moved into a new apartment and if none of this is grabbing you, don't worry, the first chapter is a bit of a slow burner but shit gets real pretty soon. Victor goes through the usual shenanigans involved with moving house, fetching the keys, using a box as a dinner table, a massive bloody sofa getting stuck in the building entrance, finding a hidden camera in the bedroom, wait what? So Victor needs to find the landlord and employ the conflict resolution tactic of punching a goddamn hole in his face. Now this is where chapter 1 ends, but since the main thrust of the story is about to be revealed and the first two chapters are sold together anyway, I'm gonna keep going. The landlord's family have spent generations trying to study the world of dreams. In fact, the apartment building was initially an institute dedicated to exactly that purpose and converted into housing later. Said landlord is the last of this family tree, and has been entering the dreams of the building's occupants for many years with the help of the titular dream machine. Unfortunately, said machine is rebelling a bit, possibly due to the state of the accommodation it's been occupying, check the state of that. Victor must now use his super special diving helmets to enter the dreams of his fellow residents and end the reign of the dream machine once and for all. Now, with possibly the longest story section ever out of the way, older viewers might be wondering why I haven't mentioned similarly stop motion games such as The Neverhood and its sequels, spiritual or otherwise, which means I have to confess to never having played them. Never got round to it, I haven't played everything. At least I'm not bullshitting you here. With that aside, my first impression came in the form of a 900 by 600 sized window. Odd that. I mean, it was started 8 years ago, but not only is that a little bit small, but I've never heard of anything using that resolution. Needless to say, it ain't widescreen. You can switch to full screen, but it'll add black bars and the resolution doesn't actually increase any, so you'll need to lean in close or deal with a bit of blurriness. Either way, you'll get a game that looks like nothing else. I mean, the people do look like this, but that reminds me of Grim Fandango, so no worries there. I'm glad to see they didn't skimp on the animation. That's always a worry when stop motion is involved, but it's nice and smooth with quite a few unique animations thrown in. It's a weird art style for me to critique because it almost seems more charming when there's obvious clay marks or something like that. And while it shouldn't have any impact on how I rate the title, I do catch myself staring at the backgrounds and marvelling over the amount of detail just because somebody physically made it like a giant train set or a matchstick house. As I said before, the Dream Machine does not rely on this gimmick, there's an actual point and click under all this. Puzzles, dialogue, your protagonist walks to wherever you click, proper stuff. Even if I'm not so fond of dragging items to use them, I prefer to be able to click once and pull it over that way. At least they let you single click to examine the items, they didn't sacrifice that. In fact, I understand why they went this route. Right clicking brings up the standard flash menu you see, so this was probably the best compromise. What I'm on the fence about is certain hotspots showing or hiding themselves depending on what item you're dragging. Bear that in mind if you see a potential puzzle solution but don't see anything to interact with. Thankfully, it didn't lead to me swinging items around the screen in a wild flailing pixel hunt most of the time. Going back to the whole this is actually a pointy click topic, there's some tricky puzzles in here, you'll want a pen and paper handy. A fair amount of poring over diaries and such, which combined with the lack of voice acting means you'll need to enjoy reading to play this. And I think this is mostly a flash game thing, but a few puzzles have you carrying out the actions as opposed to click once do thing. Pick up the spoon, move it over the flame, hold it there while something heats up, that kind of kinetic action. You might find this immersive or awkward depending on your taste, hence why I bring it up. This can be mitigated if you work out the whole puzzle in advance, which will limit the number of those actions you need to do, but for at least one of those puzzles, if you get it wrong, you have to do all the actions again. I don't see a logical way of resetting that that doesn't mean scrapping all the work and taking out the kinetic stuff, either of those, so I'm not sure how you fix that one. That's not to say all the puzzles are stuck in the comparatively harsh past. I like that examining certain containers will tell you what they used to contain. It's helpful information delivered in a natural sounding way. 
Unless you interpret it as the protagonist speaking out loud to himself for no reason, but I think we all accept that as part of the genre at this point. In any case, you're entering people's dreams, so there's a certain amount of logic you can just throw out the window. Speaking of which, people sure love to dream about floating islands, don't they? That keeps happening. My main worry for a game like this would be making puzzles that are imaginative enough to fit within a dream setting without veering into the dreaded moon logic. And whilst it's mostly dialogue, inventory and logic puzzles, they start getting imaginative fairly early on. Chapter 5 in particular got very interesting in a way that I can't really talk about without spoiling, so I won't. Setting wise, the dreams hit the mark in terms of being really quite strange, helped in no small part by the music. It's strange, as expected, but narrowing it down to a genre or type is difficult. For one thing, the game is set in the 1970s and there's no music of that time. Any character you find playing music is much older and listens to music of their own era. It all works, but no matter what music is playing, it seems to fit the scenario. And this runs the gamut from sounds of a dreamscape forest to music that can only conceivably be played on a gramophone. And they don't miss a step along the way. Except for the ear-piercing scream that plays every time you enter somebody's dream. Maybe not do that. I mean, technically it's not music, but just, just, just don't, please. The term old school springs to mind while playing this. Puzzle design hovers around difficult and dips its toes into moon logic every now and then. I can think of one example where I had to look up the solution, barely worked out why that was the solution, but couldn't remember anything hinting towards it. It seemed like a fairly logical puzzle train that was missing a vital step. Thankfully, that was a rare instance. Most of the time you simply need a bit of sideways thinking. Another old school sensibility is the kinetic stuff I mentioned earlier, where you perform almost every action. It's not really limited to certain puzzles, you see. Click to open door, click to walk through door, for example as opposed to click door once and then you're through. Or putting helmets on yourself and the person whose dream you wish to enter and making sure you put the correct helmet on the correct head. I probably would have changed that to either helmet working. It feels a bit unnecessary. These are tiny little things that build up over the course of all six chapters and you'll either find it immersion building or unnecessarily fiddly. Depends on you. As I briefly mentioned before, chapters one and two come in a single package with the other four chapters being sold separately. Now I've played episodic games before but I've never been in a situation where I bought an individual episode of something instead of the entire thing in one go. Although technically I once did both at the same time. So I can only imagine how agonising the wait between chapters was. In any case, it's all available now, and once the main plot is established, I can see each of the Bible chapters being a satisfying experience in their own right. At the time of writing, it's £16.61 for the entire bundle, and that seemed a little bit much at first, especially given the length of the initial chapters, but chapters got longer, puzzles got trickier, and before I knew it, the entire thing had taken me 12 hours to beat, so I figure the price is about right. With all those caveats, it's probably best you try the demo first. Which you can not only do for free, but you don't even need to download anything, it's in your browser. There's a link in the description for this video. Not too surprising, the game was made in Flash after all and browsers can run Flash, for now. But it's quite handy to be able to simply open a browser and try a game, it's nice. I believe that link's been up for a while though, so maybe not the exact same version as the one on Steam, but it's there, and it's free. And so is the Steam one, so take your pick. If you prefer older pointy clicks where spending an hour or two on a single puzzle isn't unusual, I think you'll get something out of this. For those of you who prefer the modern, streamlined, less obtuse way of doing things, this might not be the way to go. Think about it this way. You may have to set aside an evening for a single puzzle you're stuck on, so be sure you're comfortable with that before you buy. And reading, of course. Lots and lots of reading. It may not be to everyone's tastes, but I do need to tip my hat to not only the amount of work put in here, but for sticking it out for eight damn years. That, and I think a pretty good game came out of it. It's always nice.